Uh, my name is Chuck Wolber. I'm an associate technical fellow at Boeing. My words are my own. I do not speak for the Boeing company on this presentation. I'm going to talk about building for safety and security in a feature-focused world. Mostly I'm going to try and troll you into either understanding how safety impacts um, open source software or um, disagreeing with me, one of those two. Um, I'll consider both a success. Um, I, let's see. Yeah, threw some bio in there, don't worry about that. So I just start with my punchline. Safety is a diverse form of scrutiny that will broadly improve open source software. Uh, security was too, you can go back, I mean, uh, at all the, you know, go back to the early 90s, 80s, even before that, how security came along and it, you know, people who were just feature focused realized they had to clean up their code, they had to clean up their habits. So I think, I believe safety is going to do the same thing. But I was just talking to Steve Rostet about uh, the real time patches and he said there's a lot of stuff that they discovered in the process that we could have never run Linux on a thousand uh, CPU uh, machine if we hadn't have done all that work with, with real time. So it just solved a broad amount. So it's, it's a diverse form of scrutiny. So I hope, I hope that's enough to sell you on the idea because what's coming is a burden. Like safety is a burden, it's a pain and when you're only feature focused. So I hope I like, can sell you on the benefits to that. Uh, it will broadly improve everybody's life um, going forward. So we all know build systems, it's just a form of cat herding. You've got to build framework, you're just shoving a bunch of icons in the left. You got well-intentioned configuration and hopefully you get what you want uh, out, out the side. That's, you know, at the end of the day, a build system and it actually just kind of does look like that. These are all, I mean, they're loosely federated. The only thing we're all agreeing on is the way the von Neumann architecture works. That's pretty much it. Everybody else has opinions beyond that. Uh, spend any time with the Yocta Open Embedded Project, you hear plenty of griping about breaking changes upstream every time they revise something. Mysterious incompatibilities just suck your life away. So you upgrade something and then suddenly serial doesn't work and tests fail and no one knows why. And we're all smart, but it's just every single problem is a rabbit hole you have to dig yourself out of slowly but surely. Um, there's no easy way for these things. Upstream doesn't maintain the branch, but you know, your, your cross section, Kirkston or whatever is, is still trying to maintain that. So you, have the backporting problems. And then there's, of course, the priority mismatch. Upstream loves features. Uh, build cares about stability. So everybody's got differing priorities there. Uh, makes life a little difficult. So let's talk about safety. That's kind of what I'm bringing to the table here. When someone describes the system as sort of safe, it really means two things. Function, so specified function, that means really we've done a good job of not just hand wavy say, I want to put a new system call on the kernel, won't that be cool? Here's my use case. I have actually specified in great detail all the way down to some very low levels how the system is supposed to work. And then I've also ensured that it's deterministic behavior. So not only have I specified what I expect out of it in a very clear and understandable way, but I can expect deterministic behavior going forward. So the art of safety engineering, and it is a bit of an art, it, it involves hazard assessment. Once you assess what hazards you have to run into, I mean, these are things like, how do I handle stopping fast when there's water on the ground, those kinds of things, or how do I ensure the wings don't fall off or whatever, right? Hazard assessment. Then you have design mitigation. You gotta mitigate for those hazards in the design. And oh, by the way, that doesn't mean you can go point to the line of code that mitigates a particular hazard. So I'll get into that in a second. And then at the end, once you've got a design that mitigates the hazards, you have to actually assure that the binary that pops out the end actually matches your design. So you have implementation assurance. It's those three things. Once you have done your hazard assessment, your design mitigation, your implementation assurance, then you say you've got a safe system, you've specified your functions, and you've got deterministic behavior. That all goes together. Interrupt me if you have any questions about that. So we don't have any of this anywhere in, I mean, you know, implementation assurance, you probably recognize that as probably testing, right? Testing what though, okay? That's testing is gut instinct, you know, if for the vast majority of time, are you doing unit tests or anything like that? This is implementation assurance of the design itself. And there is no design in open source software. And that's really where, where we get to the key issue here. So this is a, don't worry about the, the details. What I'm trying to show is, 
When we talk about design, we describe a lot of times, oh, let me go to the whiteboard and draw you a picture. We'll draw you a picture and show you a box here, a box here, connects to here. The purest form of design is actually in the form of a hierarchy of shell statements. You can actually uh, increase the level of accuracy from high to low until you've almost got a point where a naive person who knows nothing about your design can actually produce an implementation without having much sophistication with respect to the implementation. So this is, uh, I'm skipping over a lot of details. We could spill thousands of gallons of ink and time and blood discuss, discussing shell statements and requirements. That's not the point of this talk. At the highest level, this is your basic idea. You're saying, I want to get from point A to point B. I want to do it safely. I want to throw 50 people in the can and have them get out fresh and relaxed, and I want to do it for this much fuel, OK? And then each one descends down all right, into, well, if I throw 50 people in the can, I'm going to have to have this radius. And you, so you've, you've increased the level of fidelity of your design all the way down, OK? That's how we decompose the design. At the very end, you've got just a series of shell statements that you should be able to just look at all those shell statements and actually recreate the system. At the highest levels of criticality, that does involve requirements all the way down to the function level. Okay, So think of the Linux kernel and how much work we have to do to get to that point. The good news, though, is that you know, we'll number them tier one to tier five. Uh, not all levels of safety criticality require going down that far. Okay, but at the highest levels of criticality, you do. Um, and so at some point, uh, we can say, actually, if we're talking at the function level or even the sub-function level, I, I can actually write those requirements and submit them to the open source project. And those can carry along with the open source project so that now someone else can come along with their bright idea up at tier one and start mapping those requirements down. To some degree, you might even be able to put tier four requirements in an open source requirement, open source project. But it's levels of generality as you go uh, as you go up, but also there's a certain level of generality as you go down too. That's why you'd be able to include some amount of design with open source projects. And of course, you have your implementation down there. Now, when we talk about cybersecurity or um, uh, we call it threat analysis or hazard assessment, okay. Someone's going to take your bright idea that you proposed there at tier one, and someone else is going to say, okay, decompose that into tier two. They're going to say, I think you've got a cybersecurity threat that we have to worry about. So they're going to inject requirements at T2. Okay? Hazard assessment. I think you're going to run the risk of these two things having a race condition and never responding to the alert correctly. Okay, we inject those requirements uh, perhaps at T2. Okay? Then engineers come along and decompose those T2s into T3s, T4s, T5s. So you can see how the idea, the mitigation, the design mitigation gets flushed down to the lowest level. So finally, if you're doing implementation at tier five, I, don't, I can't tell you, nor do I need to tell you what line of code mitigates what hazard. As long as my implementation matches tier five, I know everything traces back up and I have mitigated everything up at the tier two level. Any questions about that so far? So it all maps together, except we don't have design in the open source world, none of it. And that's the big thing preventing us from getting into the highest levels of safety. And by the way, I hope I don't have to sell you too much that if we had design riding along with open source projects as a pro forma thing, I think we'd, we'd, that level of scrutiny would produce better quality code and would reduce confusion and you know this is where we're coming from. Otherwise, you just got the git history and the mailing list arguments. Now that kind of stuff, it's very difficult to derive design from that. If you look at each tier, so that's a summation symbol here, right? So the semantic meaning of, of all the, we call them requirements, in tier one should equal the semantic meaning of all requirements and so on and so forth, such that the implementation all matches. So if I were to test all the requirements in tier one using this implementation, it should work fine for each given level. It's just the higher, uh, greater level of granularity at tier five. So that means for a high criticality product project, I don't have to test tier four, three, two, and one, right? I just test the requirements at tier five. As long as I've done my traceability well, then I know everything traces up and everything's fine. So that's the safety process also has audits built in, okay? Um, we'll talk a little bit more about um, SPDX functional safety here. Um, and so that semantic speaking at all, that's how we get our implementation assurance. 
Um, so safety problems, we've got all the loose federation problems. That is, that is there, okay? Plus, we have design expression. Design expression is really, really difficult. And some of that, like tier one to tier four, that's, that's, that's product specific. So you're never gonna get that from the open source community. But goodness, wouldn't it be great if we had some of the really low level stuff that doesn't care about the high levels of specificity at the tier one, you know, what, what, what we wanted to do, if that rode along with the designs and all the other projects could take advantage of it, okay? Implementation assurance is resource intensive. So when I change the design, how do I do all that retesting? That's a very difficult thing. Implementation assurance is also, by the way, not just testing, there's inspection, um, there's code coverage. Just because you have a test, that doesn't mean you've hit the, all the lines of code you need to. So higher levels of criticality, I actually have to not only show where the code coverage occurs, I have to show decision coverage and all that, but I actually have to show where it maps to, where the code, you know, change maps to in the object file. Uh, and then, of course, the other big one is like, a new kernel comes out, how do I assess the level of semantic change between A and B? And if you want to start product lining, if you want to start getting into turning safety critical things into products, it doesn't pay for you to sit there at kernel 2.6 and think you're going to live that way and keep selling your product. It won't work. So we don't have tools. We need tools to assess change across versions, and that allows us to do things like change impact analyses to figure out exactly how much design is affected by this as you ripple back up the requirement stack. All right, so now what, right? We, last year, Kate and I were sitting on the bus and mentioned something about requirements, and Greg just looks at us and smiles and says, no way, Colonel gets nine patches an hour, requirements are never going to be a priority. Um, Yes, I know that. We're never going to, that's, just, that's like its own subsystem. There's probably gonna have to be a requirements maintainer. There's probably going to have to be, you know, <clears throat> a patch rolls in and changes this code. There's gonna have to be a tool that says these requirements are now suspect and need to be re-reviewed and we need to keep track of that kind of stuff. Zephyr has requirements they're building in. Um, for design expression, uh, working with uh, um, SPDX, there's a functional safety sub subcommittee, I guess, um, where we're trying to create a machine readable safety model, which includes requirements. Once we come up with this, this allows us to have some sort of a schema to start contributing requirements back up to projects uh, in, in some reusable way to build tools around that. We've got for implementation assurance, uh, th this is just, this is what we're currently doing now. We need to do a lot more, but for implementation assurance, we're rolling out, we just submitted patches to include LLVM cov into the Linux kernel, just submitted them. Um, <clears throat> we've got gcov, but LLVM cov instruments at the front end. And so the gcov has a problem of once the optimizer hits the code, it's actually very difficult to tell what code path it took. Sometimes you can have uh, a, a, you know, four logical, four logic sequence, but once you get to the optimized version, of it, there's like six options to get through. So you actually can't tell which code path it took. The LLVM cov fixes that by using the front end instrumentation instead of the object code, uh, object uh, back end uh, um, instrumentation. Um, so they, they, they help each other, uh, but it does fulfill an important uh, task. And then also, uh, Boeing just rolled out a tool called Delta Kernel. Uh, I think there's a tool called, is it pronounced Cregit? Cregit? Okay, so that uh, compares versions. What Delta Kernel does is similar to that, but it allows you to specify a kernel configuration and then tell what the difference in source code is from version to version. So it allows you to get more granular for your, to your specific level. So that's kind of what I have for you um, as far as material goes, uh, I wanted to hopefully troll you guys enough to get you guys to start a dialogue or anything. I mean, these are just a few tools. Maybe if we're successful, you know, I'll follow Keys Cook and do a safety features update every year at Plumbers if we can. Um, this is just the very, very beginning of what we're trying to do. Um, any reactions, any thoughts, any, any discussion you want to have around this? Yes, Tim. Yeah, just Where's one the, second. Yeah. Thank you. So uh, I'll just make the observation that uh, you're not getting nine patches per hour on what you're actually compiling into your <laughs> into your product, right? Great. So yes. 
50% uh, of the changes coming in any particular release are for a driver. And in fact, if you look closely, I don't know, like uh, two thirds of them are, are, are like register definitions for new AMD GPUs or something ridiculous <laughs> like that. Um, and so it's not as bad as, it's bad, but it's not as bad as Greg yes. makes it out to be. Yes. <laughs> yeah, and when, when we have, and that's what we've said too, is that when someone says that very thing, it's like there's so many lines of code and blah, 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 and you're never gonna do that, you're, you're idiots. You're just as dumb as Linus was when he wanted to think he could start a kernel in his dorm room. Uh, well, no, it's mostly drivers. And when you're doing an embedded project, you know, it's, it's like you're, well, most of that's gone, you know? Yeah. So you do have a hope and a prayer of getting there. Yeah. Um, it'll be a challenge, but yeah, yeah. Anybody else? Uh, oh. Now, being the devil's advocate, yes. this, this means if I want to do a secure product or a secure build, I just have to, I just have to make sure that, uh, or it helps me if I don't need any drivers in, nowhere. Which essentially is the case that everybody says, hey, I want to have this, um, uh, this base platform and then I put everything into a Docker container because that one doesn't need drivers. <laughs> I mean, that, that's the line of thinking that they, they apply, but I, I can't put the finger on the, on the moment where they took the wrong turn. Because I'm sure they did. <laughs> so I've dabbled a little bit in the, in the space sector recently and they do exactly that. They divide it by putting it on another piece of hardware. Yes, you have to. <laughs> yeah, you have to, for safety, you have to have what's called time and space partitioning. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. so. So you, 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 most of the time, at high levels of criticality, you just can't do it. You got to put it on separate hardware. Yeah. Anything else? Do you guys at least understand the impetus for design, why it helps everybody, uh, and kind of what we're doing, at least somewhat, to get there? Love to have anybody's help uh, in these things and contributions if you can. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the other thing too is as we're going to need to maintain these kernels for longer periods of time, so I'm thinking CRA in particular here, um, being able to have a, a better traceability as to when something changes or something needs to be fixed, what the implications are, it's going to help everyone from a quality perspective. Yep. And so that's another reason to start looking in this direction. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You talked about the kernel mostly, but this is the build systems microconference, so mm -hmm. that's beyond the kernel. What impact does it have for build systems? Anything that, well, I hope like. Not I, too much. <laughs> no, no, I, I, and that's a great question. I mean, it, it really applies to, you know, um, all of these icons here, right? All these icons here, they all apply at low levels of criticality. Um, you know, you may find Nginx in, in something at low levels of criticality because there's no, you know, there's no such thing as, you know, the, th the idea of dead code or deactivated code doesn't really apply until you get to, in, in aerospace, is level C, C, B, or A. So level D, you just, you have functional requirements. So you will find this, but you do need those things. You need to have requirements and that, that kind of stuff. So, but at high levels of criticality, maybe you won't even have a library, right? It may it may just be the kernel, and you know you write some code to go with it, or an errant what's six six five three layer or something like that to to manage time and space. Well, but for instance, a medical display would have a graphical stack, mm -hmm. Wayland, mm -hmm. or a like car <laughs> with an instrument cluster, and you're overlaying a map on it, and. Have we made sure that that map is not going to flash bright colors, even though the instrument cluster is on a lay, on a overlay that is running on a highly secure, you know, maybe highly secure, but QNX system? That map is being composited from just a Yocto build that people have just sort of thrown together. What happens when someone's blinded going around a curve? You know, even though the instrument cluster is showing reliable speed, have we thought about the externalities there? Yeah, I mean, like, and what kind of information do you think, like, from a build system perspective, would be useful for the build system to provide in order to track the changes, kind of like then for the kernel? Like, is there anything that a build system can yes. help? Yes, when you can express, perspective? when you can express your design, when, you know, someday in the magical future, when we can express our design in terms of machine-readable requirements, that's like SPDX, where I can just give you an audit report. I can just say, pull down the latest. For right now, we can't pull. I cannot pull down the latest version of OE Core and just tell my developers go for it. It work. It's the other way around. Our project spins 
and then we move that pinning in a very highly regimented way. I don't, OE core doesn't get to dictate terms there. So um, this would allow us to say, when I'm ready to move from A to B, I can say, what's the impact of that change? Oh, I can show you all the code that's changed, semantic differences, shows us immediately what, ex what requirements now need, to, need review. From 100,000 requirements, now I'm down to 500 that I have to take a look at. The build system can do that for us because we've got several, you know, a whole alphabet soup of the yes. Stuff that you had your test suite that you have to run after you make a change. Yeah. To assess that you haven't had a refresh. So instead of a bright red, I don't know what changed. Now I can say, okay, there's, it's a lot, but it's doable, right? I can manage this problem. So yeah, the build system is very, very integral. If, until we have requirements and the ability to tie all that together and to design and all that kind of stuff, the build system doesn't have tendrils to grab onto. This is, this is why you know Kate's incredible work, life's work, building SPDX has helped us do with licensing, what we want to do with safety and requirements, that kind of thing, to pull it all together and design ultimately. Yeah. yeah. Well. We got more time, but. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, well, like, that's I, I guess like. Uh, if anybody want to say anything else? I guess like anything to, yeah. on, you know, from the Octa perspective, anything that we can do from the project perspective to help. In I mean, like, Delta, like uh, contributions to Delta kernel would be one. Like, I'd love to see that turned into it. It was a, it was a really, you know, as a intern driven project, we did a really good job. I was surprised how talented, you know, that the, the talent that went into this, but it's like, it's, it still needs some work cleaning it up, shaving off the sharp edges and then bringing that in as a BB class, right? That would be one way of saying uh, from A to B, what's the impact of the change? You know, what, what change? Yeah. Yeah. I'd like to say, like, having that this configuration applied and then being able to say, okay, this is what really just changed, so you can then go back to say, okay, these tests need to eventually mm. rerun. Yep. I think it would be really good from a, uh, uh, if you want to have everyone be continuously compliant with the latest kernel, being able to express this and know that you are safe in these areas, mm. I think will uh, improve the quality yep. of the yep. offering. Think about it. If you move from one to the next and you have requirements tied into all these functions, now, I can show what oh, this tiny piece that changed based on my configuration. Bam, now I've just expired 10 requirements. All the testing needs to be done for those. That's a doable thing. Yeah. So um, currently, build systems don't have a concept of delta. Correct. Uh, so we, you have to go to JIT for that. So I guess the first step then, before the even delta kernel integration, is to just be able to say anything about deltas. That, and thank you very much for that. Yes, that's the problem is it's, it's, it's just a point in time that's not three dimensional. And that's the other problem is that we, we don't get to just lockstep move forward. It doesn't work that way. I have to show what changed and that's hard. I'd love to be able to say BitBake migrate me for here and say, well, I'm not gonna migrate you, but I'm gonna show you the impact of that change doing that. Yes, on this topic. So, does uh, does BitBake preserve like a do like a snapshot of the local.com for anything like that as part of a build manifest? I don't think it. I mean, it. You can do. Um, you can dump your environment, which which, you know, and, and store that. I'll talk about this. <laughs> 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 I mean, it's obviously checked in your Git repo and you tag your build, et cetera, et cetera. So that should all tie back. Right. Yeah. So there is a little bit of traceability going on there. Yeah. Any more questions? Okay. Well, thank you. And it's a privilege to be up here. So thank you very much. Appreciate it.